Good morning, church. All right, I got a few words back. Welcome to the 11 o'clock worship service of First Baptist Church Rockport. Um, and we're always excited to be here with you guys, for everybody online um, to, to be able to share some songs and, and sing praise and worship to the Lord. Um, it's a good morning. We're, we're going to get to do that this morning. We're also going to get to hear about a special emphasis that our church is about to uh, kick off. Um, so we're excited that you're all here. We're excited that you're all watching this morning. Uh, if you would, would you stand and, and sing with us? We're going to start by, by just lifting our praise to the Lord, singing raise a hallelujah. We're going to lift our praise to, to God this morning. So... Uh, Sing along with us as we worship Him and praise Him this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes
Praise the hallelujah I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah I raise a hallelujah Amen so God, that's why we're here this morning is to lift our praises to you, to remember who you are and what you've done for us and, and respond accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Church, if you would, you could be seated just for a minute. Um, Elizabeth Brendred is going to come up and, and share with us something that God laid on her heart that she's been working toward. Um, so Elizabeth. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Brendred and I serve on the finance committee and uh, it's their duty to develop a stewardship plan for our church. So today we're kicking off our stewardship program called I Can Do More. And we'll focus on cultivating an environment of joyful giving in our church. God tells us he loves a cheerful giver. I'll be set up at the table in the entryway if you want to chat later about what all we have going on. I know God has beautiful plans for this church and the congregation to be blessed through this program, and I can't wait to see that come to fruition. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. You guys definitely make it a point to go out there and visit with her. Um, this is something that's going to be church-wide. We're introducing this with the, with the teenagers in our student ministry, uh, the children in our children's ministry. We're, we're all going to get on board and, and um, really make this a church-wide emphasis. So we look forward to everything that's to come in that. Thanks again, Elizabeth. We got a video. Oh, did not we had a video. Yeah. All right, video. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to invite you again to stand now. We're, we want to continue to worship the Lord this morning. So I'm going to pray and we're going to continue singing to him. Uh, if you're comfortable, stand and, and continue to sing with us. So um, God, how good. Thank you for moving in the hearts uh, of your people, Lord. Get us ready for what you have in store. Get us ready to meet with you, uh, maybe in different ways than we ever have, Lord, and, and see you work in Jesus' name. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues of love Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued. 
rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your cry to you. To grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing, come thou fount of our blessing. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace, hear your bride to you we sing, come thou fount of our blessing. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me i was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free now my soul can sing a new song now my heart has found a your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. It's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true, cause I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can I am yours, I am loved. 
peace abounds to me. Light the fire. Oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. Lord, you're beautiful. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. And when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. And when, and when, your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Lord, we give thanks because your word confirms to us that your eyes are on us and grace does abound. And so, Lord, as we open your word now and consider what it has to say to us, we ask that uh, you would speak what is true, and may your will be done. Lord, we love you. We turn our eyes to you. Thank you for being with us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning to all of you. Good well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Easy there. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. It's all right. Doesn't matter. We're going to be in the fourth chapter of Ephesians today. We're in the middle of this uh, series of sermons on the mission of our church. And I told you that this is really occasioned by the fact that Aransas County is celebrating 150 years of existence this year. And First Baptist Church Rockport was established not long after that. And so from that time until now, and I believe into the future, uh, the Lord has used this church to, uh, to do great things in this community. We've provided ministry for almost 150 years, and uh, we've been involved in a lot of different things that God has done here in Aransas County. And that has been true up until now. I believe it's true now, and I believe that God still has things in mind for this church for the future. And so I appreciate what Elizabeth talked to us about earlier and what the, the, the finance committee is doing and helping us to think about how we can support the work of the church because I believe that God is not finished with us yet. And in the way that God has always used this church and this community, uh, he's always provided the people and the resources that we've needed to do the work that he's called us to do. And I believe that's true now, and I believe that will continue to be true in the future. Uh, I know that this past year has been hard. Anybody want to go back and do it again? And it's been hard for our community. It's been hard for our country. Our church has also undergone a lot of changes but I believe that good things are in store. And that's why this is the time for our church to reconnect with its mission and to recommit ourselves to why God has us here in this community. And so we're talking about the mission of the church. You've probably seen it. Here it is. The mission of First Baptist Church is to lead all people to be shaped by the love of Christ. Does that look familiar? Because I've put it up there for the past three Sundays, so it should be. All right, so how will we know when we're accomplishing our mission? We've said we'll know that Christ is shaping us with his love when we make disciples who worship, connect, grow, serve, and reach. Those five things. And so uh, every Sunday we've talked about one of those things. We've talked about worship and connect. And today I want us to consider the whole concept of growth, spiritual growth, uh, the growth of the church, my own growth, our growth together. 
And why is it necessary? And so the question we want to talk about today is why is growth a necessary part of my Christian life? And if it's so necessary, you know, how, how can it happen? What does God have in mind? In the text I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 4, Paul addresses this specifically. So look with me in the text, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 11. I can't see it. I don't have my glasses on. There it is. All right, Ephesians 4, verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. All right. <clears throat> In the text, there are three things that Paul tells us related to growth. First is the what, what is growth, and then he's going to explain why is growth necessary. He'll answer the why question, and then finally, he gives us an idea of how growth takes place. And so I want to unpack all three of those things, the what, the why, and the how. We'll start first with the what. What is growth? In verses 13 through 15, I see that growth is the process church members experience together in which God moves them towards maturity in Christ. Growth is the process church members experience together in which God moves them toward maturity in Christ. And Paul uses this very important word, maturity, and it has the idea of being fully developed or Full grown, or I like ripe. It has the idea of being ripe. And don't you like a good ripe avocado? You don't want one that's hard. You want one that's ripe, that's mature, that's full grown. I said in the early service that every pot of chili has to ripen, it has to mature and reach maturity without beans. Beans hinder the maturity of every pot of chili. Sam Houston said so. All right, so when it comes to uh, the, the why or, or, or the what is growth, Paul makes several important statements here. In verse 13, we see that I mature together with other church members. And so here the idea goes against all of our individualistic impulses, all of our consumer mindset, that I focus on what's in it for me and what's best for me and my own. And Paul shifts our focus to see that my spiritual maturity really depends on our spiritual maturity. And that word mature that he uses is literally an adult person. And so he, he uses language that is to be understood corporately, not individually. And together, he says, we grow up to become an adult person, together, versus the language of verse 14, where he says, individually, we remain infants and immature. Together, we grow up and avoid the setbacks or the pitfalls of immaturity. Together, we grow to become like an adult, a person who has reached maturity separately and alone, we are prone to remain in an immature state. In verse 13, he, see, he says that our corporate maturity allows us to experience more of Christ. And so we measure the maturity of a church by nothing less than our corporate Christ-likeness. In other words, how much of Christ is present among us. 
I cannot be content with my own spiritual growth. I must long and strive for and contribute to the maturity of my church as a whole until we all together more closely resemble Christ. In verse 15, he tells us that our corporate maturity occurs in all things, in every aspect. The language here is in inclusive. Every aspect of church life, every age group, everything printed, everything said, everything done, all of it is to attain to or reveal the fullness of Christ. So whether we're talking about stewardship or voting in a business meeting or teaching in a classroom or from the pulpit, whether we're talking about caring for our members, everything we do is to reflect our maturity together in Christ likeness, or unfortunately it may reveal our lack of maturity if that would be the case but it has to do with all of it together we experience the fullness of Christ in verses 15 and 16 I see that as we mature love is to characterize all we say and do in verse 15 he says speak the truth but speak the truth in love and so we are to give voice to what we believe as Christians, but that is to be done in love for the purpose of moving people closer to what God has in mind for them over time. It moves people towards God's best for them in the long run. And in verse 16, Paul says that we are to, the church is to build itself up, and he uses construction language. Uh, we build ourselves up in love. And so love is how we evaluate the church's actions and words. Do our actions, do our words result in moving people to God's best for them in the long run? We are not everything yet that God wants us to be. The real question is, are we moving towards it? Are we maturing? Are we growing up together? You were not born into this world fully mature. Is that shocking for you? You had to do some growing up. No offense. I've only known one person who was ever even close to being fully mature when they came into this world, and that was my beautiful wife. One question that has haunted humanity since the Garden of Eden a question that I know all women ask at some point in their lives is, when will men ever grow up? Now, biologists tell us that organisms reach sexual maturity when they are able to reproduce. And in humans, we call that puberty. And it takes a long time for a human to reach that state of puberty from birth until that time of, of, of maturity physically. We take longer than almost any other organism in existence to mature. And we're not sure why. There's a lot of different theories, but it takes time. Now, scientists tell us that human females reach puberty between the age of 8 and 16. On that scale, human males reach puberty generally between the ages of 12 and 15. Now, ladies, think about that. Fifteen years old. Is any man an adult at the age of 15? And why is that? And I know women here are thinking, I know, yeah, that's physical maturity, but when do men really grow up? When does that happen? When do people reach what researchers call emotional maturity and become real grown-ups? When does that happen? Well, I have an answer. I found a British study published in 2013 that says the average man doesn't reach full emotional maturity until age 43, while women mature by age 32. Now look, math is not my strong point, but is that an 11-year disparity? Ladies, if that's true, have mercy on us. Because we're trying, and we're just a little bit behind the curve. In the survey, 80% of the women said they believed that men would never stop being childish. <laughs> women were twice as likely to believe that they were the grown-up 
in their relationship. 46% of the women surveyed had a relationship in which they felt they had to mother their male counterpart. Women claimed that they had to tell their man to act his age on average 14 times a year. That's more than once a month. Ladies, please have patience with us. We're a work in progress. What the Bible tells us is that part of this is by design. God didn't bring us into this world fully mature. No organism generally comes into existence in a fully mature state. And that's by God's will. And in the same way, you and I, when we come to faith in Christ, we must grow up in Christ. And the church also, together, we must grow and develop and attain to maturity together. Believers must mature, and the church must mature. The quest created the process of growth and maturity. He created it in the church and individually, and he also created how it would be accomplished. Church members working together to accomplish God's purposes with the gifts of the Spirit. So this answers the why question. Why do I need to experience growth or maturity? Why does the church need to go through this growth process? The answer is simple in verse 11. God thought it up and he implemented the reality that a person and a church both need to grow and mature. In verse 11, he tells us that it was Christ, it was Jesus who gave these gifts, these people to the church. And the idea is that Christ is the one who supplies everything necessary to foster the growth and maturity of the church. And in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 4, Paul gives this beautiful description of how God created the unity of the church through the Holy Spirit, and that through the Spirit, he distributes gifts of grace to the church and different callings to the church. In verse 11, we have the idea <clears throat> that the gift, the provision that God makes to the church to help it grow are people. And beloved, I want you to see that the answer, the provision that God makes every time for what we need as a church are people. It's always going to be in the form of human beings. Resources don't just magically appear on the altar. I've come and sat here all day and watched. If people don't provide the resources, it doesn't happen. And what the text is telling us is that God has provided everything the church needs by providing you. People like you. And all that he's given us through his Holy Spirit living within us, he has given us what we need in order to do the work that he's called us to do. In verse 12, we see that Christ bestows gifts of grace to equip the church to accomplish God's purposes and to help the church to grow. So people are given by Christ to equip and prepare believers for the exercise of their gifts so that the church can accomplish its mission. All that is spoken of in verses 11 and 12 is directed towards the goal of building the body of Christ. And again, the language is construction language. Something is being built. Something is moving closer to being completed. And in the text, it's the church. And God has in mind two different ways the church is growing or moving towards completion. One is related to its size. Paul tells us that God gives the church apostles and evangelists and it has the idea that some people are gifted and called to help other people come to faith in Christ and, in, and into the church. They go out and bring people in. This is a gift that God has given so that the church will reach more people. And then he has the idea that the church grows not just numerically but also internally, spiritually, so that there are those 
given to the church who are called and gifted to be prophets and pastor teachers. And these are the people who have the responsibility of helping people to get connected to the church and to mature in Christ's likeness and to discover their place and to exercise their gifts. The, the point is that God's provided for both the numerical and the spiritual growth and maturity of the church through the people he calls out to be a part of every church. You are God's provision. And that's very special. And the question I need to ask is, what is the role God created me to fill in my local church? God has something in mind specifically for you. What is that? What has God called me out? Why has he put me here? I should be preoccupied with finding that answer. All right. We've talked about the what and the why. Now let's address specifically the how of growth. Here's what I want you to see. I contribute to the growth of my church by strengthening my connection to Christ, by strengthening my connection to the members of my church, and by doing my part in the body of Christ. So how do I grow? How does the church grow? How do I contribute to the maturity, the spiritual fullness of of my church? Well, the suggestion is that I would do these three things. Address my connection to Christ, address my connection to other believers, and then take my place in the body of Christ. In verse 16... The indication is that I need to strengthen my connection with Christ. If Christ is the ultimate source of the church's growth, if Christ is the one that supplies everything that's needed, including the unity, the nourishment, and the the maturity of the church, then I need to strengthen my connection with Christ. Now look, I can't do anything about your connection with Christ. You have to address that yourself. The only person I can influence or change is me. So I need to strengthen my connection with the Lord. And hopefully by doing that, is that the Lord? Yes, Lord. It's time to to wrap this up. Okay. Uh, By strengthening my connection with the Lord, I might be able to encourage others to do the same, but first things are first. I need to address my connection to Christ. Secondly, in verse 16, it tells us that I'm connected by the Spirit with every member of my church. Therefore, I must strengthen and maintain that connection. So, again, Paul focuses on the growth of the body as a whole, not the growth of individual parts of the body. The point is for all of us to grow together in Christ. Now, when that happens, I grow too. That's true. But that's never to be my focus. Paul says I'm joined together with the body of Christ, and we are held together. Even each small supporting ligament, he says, we are united by God's Spirit under the head of the body, who is Christ. And since we are put together by Christ, by God's Spirit, in the body of Christ, I should take that seriously and seek to strengthen those connections and not weaken them. The temptation is to walk away or to avoid or lessen those connections, especially with people we don't get or agree with, those who've hurt us, those we don't understand, or those we don't know. And Paul says the opposite is what we should be focusing on. And I should be seeking out to strengthen all of the connections in the church, individually. This class with that class, this organization with this one, and this age group with this age group. We should be focusing on what we can do to strengthen our connections. Now, I have some advice for you. If you feel like you're not very well connected to the church, next Sunday, sit somewhere else. And I promise you, if you're sitting in someone's spot, they're going to tell you. And when they do, introduce yourself. And get to know them and see how that goes. That's what we need to be doing. And it's something I can't make happen. You have to be committed to it. And either you are or you're not. And we need to be strengthening our relationships, our connections to one another. And so 
Paul says, I focus on my connection with Christ. I also take seriously my connections with others in the church. Finally, in verse 16, he says, I'm to fulfill my God-given role in the body of Christ. Every member of the body receives what is needed to perform his or her proper function so that the growth of the whole body is healthy and strong just as God designed it. So because that's true, I should eagerly exercise my gift for the good of the whole church. I support and encourage you as you do the same. And as each one of us shows up and takes our place and does what we're called to do, then the church grows and matures, and it accomplishes the purpose, purposes for which God called us. See, there are things I can do. Connect with Christ. Foster my connections with my brothers and sisters in Christ and then take my place in the body of Christ as God has provided for it. Now there are things that we should all be doing that contribute to our physical maturity. We've all heard these things. Our doctors have said it. We need to sleep. We need to eat right and exercise. Any of that sound familiar? Is there anything we can do to contribute to our emotional maturity? How can we foster our growth to become healthy, mature adults in this life? In the British study that I mentioned earlier, the, men, the women surveyed mentioned the top maturity fails of men. These are things that men do that do not make them mature. And here they are. Finding their own passing of gas and burps amusing. Men, that pull my finger joke, that's probably not as funny as we thought. Number two, finding rude words amusing. I giggle every time someone says duty. It's probably not as funny as I think it is. Number three, trying to beat children at games and sports. Hey, who's your daddy? Yeah, I probably take more enjoyment of that than I should. Number four, staying silent during an argument. <sighs> And number five, not being able to cook simple meals. Men, we're talking simple meals. It's a package of ramen. Boil the water. You can do it. You can do it. Instead, doctors and psychologists and school counselors have suggested some things that people can do to grow up as persons. And these are the kinds of things we should be encouraging in our children. All kinds of things, such as don't be a bully. Avoid gossip, rumors, and talking about people behind their backs. Be a bigger person if someone is unkind to you. Keep an open mind and be eager to learn. Have confidence in yourself. Accept personal responsibility. Take control of what you can and be genuine. And researchers tell us the more we can foster these kinds of behaviors in our life, the more likely we are to be healthy, to grow up and mature, and to be a presence in our relationships that is actually helpful rather than someone who uh, creates a lot of drama and has a lot of neediness. There are things that I can do as a Christian so that I and my church will mature. I need to focus on these things. And the question I should ask is, am I contributing to the maturity of my church by nurturing my own connection with Christ, by nurturing my connections with other believers, and by doing my part in the body of Christ? As I close this morning, I want to invite you to consider making two different kinds of commitments today. First of all, I invite you to make a commitment to being a part of the growth and maturity of your church. Help your church to experience the fullness of Christ and to become more like Christ in all its words and actions. This may not be on your radar at all, but I hope this morning that you'll consider making a commitment to being a part of what God wants to do, not just in your life, but in your church and through your church in the community and beyond. Make a commitment to being a part of the growth, the maturity of your church. Secondly, I invite you to contribute to the maturity of your church 
by nurturing your own relationship to Christ, by nurturing your connections with other church members, and by doing your God-given part in your church. And as I said earlier, this, this past year has been hard, and it could be that this is exactly where God wants to deal with us. Maybe as a result of everything that's happened this past year, I've simply fallen away from my relationship with Christ. And there is something lacking there. It could be that as a result of what's happened this past year, that we've neglected our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe we've walked away, we've let things go, and it's time to pick those things back up again. And it could be that as a result of this past year, you've hoped that someone else would do the things that needed to be done in the church. And maybe God is saying to you recently, now it's time for you to, to re-engage. I have something in mind for you. It's time for you to, to find it and to do it. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And then Wes will come and lead us in a time of response. And while we're singing, you can respond to the word of the Lord and what he's saying to you about your spiritual growth and how you're a part of the growth of this church as a whole. And this morning, I'm going to do what I haven't done in a while, and that is I'm going to be down front. I'm going to have my mask on. If you want to come and pray with me, I'm going to be here while we're singing. And I would love to hear from you. Or if there's some kind of decision that God has put on your heart this morning that you want to talk to me about, that's where I'll be. When the service is over, I'm going to be out in the foyer. If you want to come and talk to me out there, I would love to visit with you about what God is saying to you. But I'm going to pray, and then Wes will lead us in a time of singing. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for being a God who provides for all of our needs. Through your word, through your Holy Spirit, your presence with us, but also through the church through the people who make up the church. And Lord, I want to take that seriously because your word says that our growth depends on one another, our maturity, our ability to experience the fullness of Christ depends on the other members of my church. So Lord, I pray that today, in ways that are appropriate, you would call us to that, to making a commitment to that. And Lord, for every one of us, I pray that you would show us what we can do today to strengthen our relationship with you, to strengthen our connections with the other people in our church. And Lord, show us how to stand up and take our place in the body of Christ the way you've designed us to. Lord, we trust that as we do that, you'll manifest your presence among us. Your will will be accomplished among us, and we will fulfill your purposes through this church in the world. And now, Lord, may your will be done. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we chose this song for closing this morning that I think has um, a common analogy that we see through scripture about um, these challenging times that Pastor Scott is referring to that maybe we've been experiencing over the last year um, being like fire and this idea that I would ask God to refine me with fire can be a scary thing to pray but I think that in some cases we the fire we've experienced has caused us to withdraw like he's talking about or isolate or um, pull back from the body of Christ. And so as I'm thinking about this song this morning as it relates to the, to the sermon, I hope that we wouldn't be afraid to ask God to teach us what this refinement has been like and draw us closer to him and then closer to one another. Refiner's fire My heart's one desire Is to be
choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Here I am, open arms, draw me close, Lord, to your heart. You're my rock, you're my refuge, my delight, Lord, my delight is in you. My delight is in you. to be comes and dismisses us today, it's my privilege to introduce to you uh, Rosalind and Michael Collins. Would y'all stand down here at the front here? They've come this morning. They've been attending our church for a long time, but this morning they're coming to uh, officially unite with our church by promise of letter from the First Baptist Church in Victoria. And so uh, if you would just affirm what God has done in leading them here to be a part of our church, and if you would commit to welcoming them into the body of Christ, would you say amen? Amen. And on your way out today, you might want to come by and shake their hands or give them a hug in a way that is safe and doesn't give anybody COVID. Uh, do that this morning. So blessed to be able to, uh, to welcome people in our church. So, Ray, would you come and dismiss us today? And would you please pray with me? You know, Father, these are indeed difficult times, and we have been challenged and most of us have have had the feelings of uh, defeat and loneliness and uh, anxiousness, worry. But then when we turn to you, you remind us that we are more than conquerors in you, that uh, there's no power that can overcome us. And for the loneliness, you remind us that you never leave us alone, you'll never forsake us. Your presence is always assured. And for the worries and concerns and cares that uh, you have full control over all these circumstances uh, and that you'll carry us through, that you'll give us exactly what we need. And like Scott has said, you're growing us. You're going to use these events to, to mold us uh, even more into the people you've created us to be. So we need to remember to thank you for all the blessings that you provide, even during these difficult times, that you are so merciful, that you continue to watch over us, that you are faithful even when we fall short. And we look forward to what you're going to be doing. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Indeed. Indeed.